This is the Philosophical Angle, defining concepts in current media. I am your host, Chris Angle. Uh, I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. These books are available free online for viewing at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me are our panelists, Mark Brennan, professor at the schools at the Stern School of Business, New York University. He's also the American editor of the Quarter, Quarterly Review of London, England, established 1809. Rick Samuelson is also with us. He graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton, and an MA from Tufts. He was also retired head of securities UBS Japan. Welcome, guys. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts being used in current media and compare the essence of the concept with the usage and circumstances in which the term is being used. The format of the philosophical angle is that your host will bring forth an opening statement on the nature of the concept of your consideration, and our distinguished panel will react with their criticisms, questions, their own definitions and comments. This week, uh, we have a special edition called What Would You Do? Periodically, we have a special edition, and it takes note of worldly or international predicaments of moment to the U.S. and renders this to our panel and to our listening audience by posing the great conundrum, what would you do were you a presidential candidate? And so we commence with this subject. In the last four years, spending by the U.S. government has escalated to more than 24 percent of GDP, the fourth highest in the years since 1946. The Wall Street Journal reports that in the current fiscal year 2012, President Obama predicts that spending will increase by $193 billion to $3.8 trillion, or about 24 percent of the gross domestic product. The Obama budget indicates another deficit of $1.3 trillion in 2012. Recently, the uh, Obama budget came out for the fiscal year 2013 with a proposal of tax increases on the wealthy and, and defense spending cuts. The budget is a display of the government's intent to take more, spend more, somewhat akin to a spoiled brat. Obama and the Democratic Congress has added an astounding $5 trillion in debt in a single presidential term. National debt held by the public will hit 74 percent this year and will keep rising. How are we, the American people, to get the politicians to reduce the cost of the soaring governmental budget? In these times of runaway government deficit spending, the philosophical angle would like to suggest in this year of a presidential race that a candidate come forth and embrace spending cuts. One cut that was suggested by our panelist Rick Samuelson was a 10 percent across the board cut to be put in place. As Rick mentioned, it would cut across all spending and thus slice into everybody's budget equally. What politician looking to appear fiscally rational not embrace such a recommendation? Your host suggested to eliminate the baseline increases that are built into the federal budget, resulting in yearly automatic increases no matter if the politicians pass a budget or not. Well. The philosophical angle has another suggestion for spending cuts. We suggest to the presidential Republican candidate, or any candidate, to resurrect Milton Friedman's idea of the negative income tax system, as noted in his books, Capitalism and Freedom and Free to Choose. 
I can hear your reaction. What's that, you say? Well, to explain. Presently, the entire welfare, welfare system of the U.S. is run by large governmental bureaucratic departments. There are many types of welfare, which include such programs as food stamps, Medicare, Medicaid, farm supports, child welfare, corporate welfare, housing welfare, unemployment welfare, and so on and so on. Instead of having all these programs run by a host of large governmental agencies with their huge bureaucracies and their huge staffing, they could be consolidated into one U.S. bureaucratic institution that is known to be efficient and effective called the IRS. As, as already required by government, everybody or almost everybody must file a return with the IRS. The negative income tax would be when an individual or an, an individual and his family income or lack of income falls below a certain level. The various welfare benefits start to kick in. And just as somebody who overpays during the year gets a refund from the IRS, so would welfare recipients for whatever reason, whether it be for medical care, housing, food, unemployment, or whatever other welfare programs there are out there. Under a proposal of the negative income tax, each person, depending on their income level, would pay or receive a subsidy. The rates of subsidy would be graduated just as the rates of taxation are in the current system. In this way, it would be possible to set a floor below which no man's base income could fall. The advantage of this arrangement are clear. It makes explicit the cost borne by society. It would reduce government costs by allowing for, uh, for the downsize of government, while whole departments could be eliminated and thus would cost far less than the government is now spending directly. Another advantage is that this system of negative income tax is directed specifically at the problem of poverty. It gives help in the form most useful to the individuals, namely cash. Overall, it's efficient. It would be an advantage in its cost savings to the myriad of government welfare systems presently in place. Let's go to our panel for their reaction. Mark, I'd like to start with you first, please. Sure. I would just like to point out, Chris, that we may have reached a point in the lifespan of this show where it's time to hang it up, because if you're now invoking Milton Friedman as the savior for the United States, we have serious problems. We have time and again on this show talked about the overbearing power of the central government, the federal government, and no one in the 20th century did more to empower the United States federal government than Milton Friedman through his one little shady trick of inventing and foisting upon an unwitting public the withholding mechanism in your paychecks. You used to square up with the government every April 15th. Milton Friedman had the better idea in order to fund World War II to slowly bleed us dry every paycheck. Just take a little bit so people don't even know that it's being taken out. And nothing has done more to empower the federal government in the 20th century than that one little shady move by that pseudo-conservative. Um, you also used the word, and, and by the way, and then you started going on about the negative income tax to, you know, fund welfare and all that stuff. We've done show after show after show talking about how welfare and supposed charity coming from the central government is irresponsible and never does it ever take into account cost and benefit. So now you're talking, you're, you're again promoting another program that's going to revert more power back to the central government. You also used the word astounding, astounding gain of $5 trillion, a rise in $5 trillion in the national debt under Obama. Well, what I think was astounding, Chris, was the fact that it started at $10 trillion when he took office. You didn't make any comment about that. 
And then also, you know, we're not even accruing for the future future expenses we're going to have for something like the idiotic, unjust Iraq war that Joseph Stiglitz has put the price tag on of three trillion dollars. So you, before before you start slamming the extreme communists, you might as well start slamming the mainstream communists like Bush too, and all the clowns who got us to ten, 10 trillion to start. And lastly, one suggestion might be to take a little look back in history, and consider a president who is in my opinion, coming back into favor, uh, if for no other reason than the fact that he actually cut government and he's kind of laughed at, and he's especially, people hate, especially hate him now. Uh, all the warmongers hate him now because, because of his foreign policy outlook. But he's the president who in the mid-70s said that the sum of the special interests is not necessarily the national interest. Think about that saying when you think about American policy towards Israel and Cuba, just for two random examples. But what Jimmy Carter did that was good was he abolished two cabinet level departments, the Civil Aeronautics Board and the Interstate Commerce Commission. You show me one president in the 20th century who's done anything close to that, and I'll give you a nickel. Because Comrade Bush instituted the TSA. Comrade Bush gave us No Child Left Behind, which just helped the Department of Education grow. Comrade Bush gave us a Schedule D benefit on, in healthcare. You tell me who was less of a communist in that case. Bush or Carter. So while you're busy smashing Obama for growing the debt from, from $10 trillion to $15 trillion, let us not forget that it was $10 trillion when he took office. And we have not accrued for the future expenses for Iraq, which, by the way, under GAAP, this country would be bankrupt. And you can uh, uh, put a lot of that stuff on all Obama's predecessors. And I'm no fan of Obama. <laughs> Rick, uh, you're up for your, for your comments? Well. I mean, I don't see, I guess, how the negative in income tax concept addressed as the, the really pressing problem of runaway entitlement spending. Uh, and if, I, you know, as a presidential candidate, it seems long overdue that one of them, or more, more than one of them, would take a stand on either the Simpson Bowles proposals or Paul Ryan's proposals, you know, something that's hard and fast and maybe even put forward something more extreme along the lines of a, an across the board cut. And not, I'm not talking about a cut in proposed increases. I'm talking about actual reductions, right? Right. And uh, good, so, clar good clarification on the difference. Actually, uh, if you yeah. could expound upon the difference uh, a little bit, that would, uh, uh, our, our audience would appreciate it. Chris, all, all these, all these, all these pot. Well, one second, oh, one second, Mark. One second, uh, uh, Rick. If you could expound upon the difference between the uh, actual cut and uh, a baseline cut, when you said. Well, uh, in government speak or government thinking, uh, increases are assumed, right, and they're built into the cost structure. And so what they view as a cut is a reduction in an increase, not an actual reduction in last year's expenditure. And that is true across basically all governments, certainly in the United States, but in, including state governments. We have the same problem here in Washington. Yeah, that's, Washington. that's right. So, uh, and that's you know, it's, the... a, it's, it's, a, it's a nonsense approach to uh, budgeting, right? And, and no business could possibly uh, work work that way, or would work that Right, and it's all due to the, the baseline. The funny thing is, when you're in a business, as I've been, I've gotten orders to cut 10% of my staff, you know, in a, in a month's time, and I've had to do so. Not 10% of the proposed increase in the number of staff next year, 10% of the existing staff. Go out and find them and shoot them. That's the way business works. Yeah, but Rick, when you had to do that, you weren't about to be attacked by communists or attacked by terrorists or attacked by Iran, and people weren't going to starve to death and freeze to death. So that wasn't, you know, your business issues are not really analog here. Well, um, they Chris, are. Chris, uh, just to go back for a second, because that's the arguments you'll get for any kind of cut. Every rent-seeking jerk will go running down to Washington and say, no, no, you can't do it. We'll all die if these things are cut. Um, I heard a guy on the radio this morning, Chris, when now they're talking about five dollar per gallon gas because we've got to, you know, pull the mine, pull the mines that Iran's going to put in the Strait of Hormuz out of the water. 
And I heard a guy say, well, if it goes to the random, random guy on the street that they're interviewing on the street, probably representative of a lot of Americans, and he said, you know what, if it goes to $5 a gallon, I think we should each get a $100 check from the U.S. government to help us cover our gas. And really the problem there is I think he's representative and indicative of the fact that this, this is cultural rot, and this goes really deep, that someone would even think that that is a reasonable proposal. And when you start talking about all these policy proposals to cut things, it's just, it's just tinkering and tweaking. We need people like that moron to wake up and realize that Washington, D.C., much like the insurance companies in tort cases, are not just big piles of money that people can just dip into at will and take money and just dole it around where they need it. It actually has to come from somewhere. So, but if, you know, if, if we're, if we're going to have a policy tweak, I'd like to throw one out there, and that would be the following. Every congressman, every time he proposes a piece of legislation that's going to be an expenditure of the U.S. government, I think there should be an itemized bill sent to every member of his congressional district and say, here, your guy has an idea, you pay for it. Uh, good point. And, uh, but um, I would like to get back to uh, the, uh, the, analogous, the analogy between uh, the type of, uh, of spending of a government and business. The government uh, is, uh, uh, is spending increases and uh, budgetary savings, as reported in the media, is due to baseline cost increases, where the increases from year to year are automatic and they're already set in the law so that uh, when any uh, savings is, and that's how they refer to it, savings, it's actually a decrease in the baseline increases that are coming uh, uh, before us. Um, and, and so it, the accounting measures are, uh, are, sir, uh, are of course, non-analogous to, uh, to business. Uh, and uh, I would like to go also go back to the very beginning, Mark, uh, of your uh, remark. You mentioned that Milton Friedman uh, started the withholding tax. I thought that was done, uh, he was an economist of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and I thought withholding uh, was established way before that. That's right, it was established in 1942, and you were told if you owed more than $75 on your income tax for that year, thanks to Milton Friedman, if you would sign up for the withholding mechanism, you could forego your tax payment for that year. That was his proposal to the U.S. government. Look it up. It's just, you know, another, another uh, uh, feather in his cap towards bringing down this country. Okay, and, in, uh, and the purpose here is the reason why we began to uh, this issue uh, today is that it is in current media. So we recognize that the deficit of $10 million um, has uh, previously uh, been um, uh, an issue for many years, but it's uh, presently uh, come forward in, the, in present media uh, because of the, uh, uh, the huge increases that have incurred uh, pre uh, compared to the last 10 years. And so uh, that's why it's in current media, and that's why we're discussing it today. Not that any previous uh, uh, administration is is uh, is absolved of of uh, whatever debt increases they've incurred. Well, it's, it's just it's just funny that you don't hear a peep until suddenly it starts growing a little faster than usual. Um, okay, and then so. Um, uh, you mentioned also uh, that the ICC uh, uh, was uh, that Jimmy Carter got rid of the ICC. Is that not still in existence? The international or the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission? No, he abolished that in the Civil, Aer the Civil Aeronautics Board. Oh, the Civil. Okay. We, 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 need, we need wholesale abolitionists. So it's not just across the board cuts uh, to, to expense lines. We need to abolish things like the Department of Energy, which Carter created. We need to abolish the Department of Education. We need, there, there are whole departments that should be abolished. But imagine proposing that, you know, your average American, this is where, you know, the costs are diffuse and the benefits are concentrated. Well, if you were to propose that, if you were to gather up all my friends and say, hey, let's go down to Washington, D.C. and, 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 and have stage a march for the, for the abolition of, of the Department of Commerce, none of my friends would want to waste a weekend doing that. And if we did, if I got any kind of a, you know, a serious group of people to go down there, every single employee of the Department of Commerce would be out there in a counter protest, funding whatever they had to do to keep their jobs because they're rent seeking. So our system is flawed by design, and for that reason alone, these things will never be abolished. This bureaucracy has grown and grown and grown, and now it's out of control, and it's controlling us. Well, I, I absolutely agree with you, and uh, that's our purpose here today. 
And I think that the negative income tax uh, would be helpful in uh, promoting exactly what you've just uh, suggested, which is to uh, eliminate uh, such departments as the Department of Education or Department of Welfare, or if there is such a department, or the depart uh, uh, several administrative bureaucracies by consolidating them into the uh, IRS uh, through the negative income tax system. I th uh, uh, is that not uh, commensurate with, uh, with, your, uh, with your ultimate purpose, to just eliminate you several devolve, departments? You want to devolve more, more control and power to the IRS? That's a scary thought. Well, you've already eliminated, you've already given up your control uh, uh, to, uh, uh, for your welfare tax dollars to the government. Um, it would be more transparent this way in because checks are cut uh, uh, on everybody's uh, uh, IRS return. And it would be clear, and I would think it also would, be, it would eliminate uh, or help eliminate uh, corruption. I mean, uh, the, the famous stories you hear on, on TV and in the news of uh, women in mink coats going down with their uh, food stamps and buying food. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, less, I'm less bothered by them than billionaires in Boca Raton going out for filet mignon dinners with their totally legal and totally proper Social Security checks. So for every for every every welfare queen you can find, I'll show you 50 uh, multi-millionaires dining on, on, on our kids' dimes. Well, I agree with that too, of course. Uh, but uh, the 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 issue again is uh, is to help eliminate government expenditures and right. Uh, so the, the last the last thing the last thing we want want to do is to have the government cutting checks to anybody because when the government cuts checks, it doesn't look to where they're going. You write checks. Right. You and Rick write checks. You look to who it's going and you sign it. If you gave your checkbook to a random person and said, "Hey, would you mind paying my bills for the next year?" Well, you probably have to. You probably have to have your have your head examined, and that's essentially what the U.S. does with its checkbook. It just sends checks everywhere, including multi billions of dollars from poor people in this rich country to rich people in poor countries under the guise of foreign aid. Well, clearly the IRS uh, uh, is very. The the criteria would be very clear. A certain. Uh, 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 amount of income is required in order to get a check. So uh, it, it, because it's clear, it would reduce fraud. Okay, perfect. So, so fraud's abolished. That's brilliant. Well, if you, if you show me a better uh, suggestion, I'm willing to listen to it. Rick, uh, you have, have you anything to say on, the, uh, on this idea of the negative income tax or uh, the other uh, items that we've uh, here in our notes of uh, eliminating baseline spending? Or, uh, or, the, or, or again, I think we've well, agreed on I, certainly on your 10 percent tax uh, decrease or ta uh, uh, budget decrease. You know, I, I wouldn't want to look at that measure in isolation. What's long overdue is, is clearly a, re a rationalization of the uh, tax system toward a more a flatter uh, system with fewer exclusions and re uh, deductions, and that, that all needs to be cleaned up. And it, it just seems to me that. A negative income tax would be a pretty blunt instrument when you've got a a tax code that is so elaborate and and in which, by the way, already 50 percent of uh, taxpayers don't pay any tax at all, right? And, and the other 50 percent couldn't even come within a thousand basis points of telling you what their marginal tax rate is because it's so opaque. True. Uh, the tax code, uh, you have no, uh, no objection here. Uh, I totally agree with you. The tax code uh, is a huge problem. And uh, uh, in the media the other day, it was reported that, when, uh, that a lot of the uh, candidates, when they go out and speak uh, uh, in front of uh, the, the town hall uh, type speeches, that when asked about the tax code, almost everybody in the room raises their hand in in confirmation that the tax code needs to be uh, simplified. So, uh, and, Mitt, and, and Mitt will do that because he's the best. Are you being facetious or, uh, or uh, is that a serious statement? Mark. Anyone who thinks that e either, either wing of the war party, the Republicrats or, or, or the Democrats, to think, if anyone thinks that either wing of the war party has a solution to this, they're smoking crack, and they probably are good friends with that guy on the radio this morning who I heard say, we should all be given a $100 check from the government if, if oil goes to 5 bucks a gallon. Well, there has to be some solution, and, and, uh, and that's why the political process is, 
uh, hopefully of some use uh, in being able to... You know, Chris, to... Chris, unfortunately, sometimes there aren't solutions, uh, and, and, and there's no change until catastrophe hits. And I just see us yes. going right down that path. It, it's going to be catastrophic. We're, we're too fat, dumb, and happy, and spoiled and entitled to make any kind of sacrifice, and we are going to have some kind of Zimbabwean Weimar crash in this country, and our heads are going to be handed to us, and we're going to be talking about violence and social problems and riots, and then it's going to change, and not until then. We will shoot ourselves in the foot. We will kill ourselves until then. Nancy Pelosi will spend. Mitt Romney will tax, and we will just live like kings until the markets or another country or another military tells us, game over, folks. You're out of here. Rick, I see you nodding your head. Uh, was uh, you have some well, I mean, I mean, the, the first shot over the bow was uh, the uh, de decline in the U.S. credit rating. I mean, that that you know, was that anybody, was unthinkable. Was anybody paying attention to that? Did anyone care? I mean, it was a shot. It's as if it didn't bow. happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and then and then the story you hear is, oh, but it's still better than their the U.S. bonds are better than every other country's bonds. Oh, okay, that's good. So I guess that means that when all countries go down, we, Chris, we've reached a level of insanity and level of entitlement, uh, and and I, I I give a lot of the blame to the baby boomers, uh, and we're gonna be we're gonna have we're gonna have our comeuppance. And I'm, Rick, not, I'm not rooting for it. I'm fearing it. And when it happens, this country, it, the the entire our, the entire regime is corrupt right now. The media, the press, politicians, universities, it's all corrupt. Uh, but there will be radical change, and I just hope that the radical. A lot of times, when there's radical change, it's even worse what comes in. Look what happened to Russia. Look what happened to Cuba. Look what happened to you know to the Weimar Republic. Now we've got Nazis. It's, it's it has the potential to be a lot worse if we don't fix it, and we're not going to. Rick, any final comments? I and uh, I noticed that uh, you were agreeing while Mark was saying that uh, when doom comes, that is the only uh, the only time when the political system will change. Well, I mean, all I can say is, this. look, in the face of these kinds of runaway deficits, the fact that you don't see more public alarm, except amongst, you know, Tea Party people, and I know a, a lot of the people in Tea Party, these are, you know, kind of average, in many cases, not very wealthy, decent folks. Something is very, very wrong, but they're not exactly sure what to do about it, they're just angry and they're up against a system that is so entrenched and so large and so difficult to tackle uh, that they are in, in a sense uh, burning a lot of rubber and not not getting very far uh, but they're for the most part they have the right idea they have a vague sense that something is we're, we're heading off of a cliff fiscally, financially, and that if we don't change this course, there will be the, the kind of disaster Mark is talking about. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, we, so in that, in that, I see a little bit of hope. Rick, we're running out of time, and I want to thank you guys uh, from the studios here in the United States of Greece uh, for your time, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you, guys. Ciao. Thank you.